Yes, said the dealer. Our windfalls are of various kinds. Some customers are ignorant, and then I touch a dividend on my superior knowledge. Some are dishonest, and here he held up the candle so that the light fell strongly on his visitor. And in that case, he continued, I profit by my virtue. Markheim had but just entered from the daylight streets, and his eyes had not yet grown familiar with the mingled shine and darkness in the shop. At these pointed words, and before the near presence of the flame, he blinked painfully and looked aside. The dealer chuckled. You come to me on Christmas Day, he resumed, when you know that I am alone in my house, put up my shutters, and make a point of refusing business. Well, you will have to pay for that. You will have to pay for my loss of time when I should be balancing my books. You will have to pay, besides, for a kind of manner that I remark in you today very strongly. I am the essence of discretion and ask no awkward questions. But when a customer cannot look me in the eye, he has to pay for it. The dealer once more chuckled, and then, changing to his usual business voice, though still with a note of irony, you can give, as usual, a clear account of how you came into the possession of the object, he continued. Still your uncle's cabinet? A remarkable collector, sir. And the little, pale, round-shouldered dealer stood almost on tiptoe, looking over the top of his gold spectacles and nodding his head with every mark of disbelief. Markheim returned his gaze with one of infinite pity and a touch of horror. This time, said he, you are in error. I have not come to sell, but to buy. I have no curios to dispose of. My uncle's cabinet is bare to the wainscot. Even were it still intact, I have done well on the stock exchange, and should more likely add to it than otherwise. And my errand today is simplicity itself. I seek a Christmas present for a lady, he continued, waxing more fluent as he struck into the speech he had prepared. And certainly I owe you every excuse for thus disturbing you upon so small a matter. But the thing was neglected yesterday. I must produce my little compliment at dinner. And as you very well know, a rich marriage is not a thing to be neglected. There followed a pause, during which the dealer seemed to weigh this statement incredulously. The ticking of many clocks among the curious lumber of the shop, and the faint rushing of the cabs in a near thoroughfare, filled up the interval of silence. Well, sir, said the dealer, be it so. You are an old customer, after all. And if, as you say, you have the chance of a good marriage, far be it from me to be an obstacle. Here is a nice thing for a lady now, he went on. This hand glass, 15th century warranted, comes from a good collection, too. But I reserve the name in the interests of my customer, who was, just like yourself, my dear sir, the nephew and sole heir of a remarkable collector. The dealer, while he thus ran on in his dry and biting voice, had stooped to take the object from its place. And as he had done so, a shock had passed through Markheim, a start both of hand and foot, a sudden leap of many tumultuous passions to the face. It passed as swiftly as it came, and left no trace beyond a certain trembling of the hand that now received the glass. A glass, he said hoarsely, and then paused, and repeated it more clearly. A glass, 
for Christmas? Surely not. And why not, cried the dealer, why not a glass? Markheim was looking upon him with an indefinable expression. You ask me why not, he said. Why, look here, look in it, look at yourself. Do you like to see it? No, nor I, nor any man. The little man had jumped back when Markheim had so suddenly confronted him with the mirror. But now, perceiving there was nothing worse on hand, he chuckled. Your future lady, sir, must be pretty hard favored, said he. I ask you, said Markheim, for a Christmas present, and you give me this, this damned reminder of years and sins and follies, this hand conscience. Did you mean it? Had you a thought in your mind? Tell me. It will be better for you if you do. Come, tell me about yourself. I hazard a guess now that you are in secret a very charitable man. The dealer looked closely at his companion. It was very odd. Markheim did not appear to be laughing. There was something in his face like an eager sparkle of hope, but nothing of mirth. What are you driving at? the dealer asked. Not charitable, returned the other gloomily. Not charitable, not pious, not scrupulous, unloving, unbeloved. A hand to get money, a safe to keep it. Is that all? Dear God, man, is that all? I will tell you what it is, began the dealer with some sharpness, and then broke off again into a chuckle. But I see this is a love match of yours, and you have been drinking the lady's health. Ah, cried Markheim, with a strange curiosity. Ah, have you been in love? Tell me about that. I, cried the dealer, I in love. I never had the time, nor have I the time today for all this nonsense. Will you take the glass? Where is the hurry? returned Markheim. It is very pleasant to stand here talking, and life is so short and insecure that I would not hurry away from any pleasure, no, not even from so mild a one as this. We should rather cling, cling to what little we can get, like a man at a cliff's edge. Every second is a cliff, if you think upon it, a cliff a mile high, high enough if we fall, to dash us out of every feature of humanity. Hence it's best to talk pleasantly. Let us talk of each other. Why should we wear this mask? Let us be confidential. Who knows? We might become friends. I have just one word to say to you, said the dealer. Either make your purchase, or walk out of my shop. True, true, said Markheim. Enough fooling. To business. Show me something else. The dealer stooped once more, this time to replace the glass upon the shelf, his thin blond hair falling over his eyes as he did so. Markheim moved a little nearer, with one hand in the pocket of his greatcoat. He drew himself up and filled his lungs. At the same time, many different emotions were depicted together on his face. Terror, horror, and resolve, fascination, and a physical repulsion. And through a haggard lift of his upper lip, his teeth looked out. This perhaps may suit, observed the dealer. And then, as he began to re-arise, Markheim bounded from behind upon his victim. The long, skewer-like dagger flashed and fell. The dealer struggled, like a hen, striking his temple on the shelf, and then tumbled on the floor in a heap. Time, 
had some score of small voices in that shop, some stately and slow, as was becoming to their great age, others garrulous and hurried. All these told out the seconds in an intricate chorus of tickings. Then the passage of a lad's feet, heavily running on the pavement, broke in upon these smaller voices and startled Markheim into the consciousness of his surroundings. He looked about him awfully. The candle stood on the counter, its flame solemnly wagging in a draught. And by that inconsiderable movement the whole room was filled with noiseless bustle and kept heaving like a sea. The tall shadows nodding, the gross blots of darkness swelling and dwindling as with respiration, the faces of the portraits and the china gods changing and wavering like images in water. The inner door stood ajar and peered into that leaguer of shadows with a long slit of daylight like a pointing finger from these fear-stricken rovings. Markheim's eyes returned to the body of his victim, where it lay both humped and sprawling, incredibly small and strangely meaner than in life. In these poor miserly clothes in that ungainly attitude the dealer lay, like so much sawdust. Markheim had feared to see it, and lo, it was nothing. And yet, as he gazed, this bundle of old clothes and pool of blood began to find eloquent voices. There it must lie. There was none to work the cunning hinges or direct the miracle of locomotion. There it must lie till it was found. Found! Aye, and then... Then would this dead flesh lift up a cry that would ring over England and fill the world with the echoes of pursuit. Ay, dead or not, this was still the enemy. Time was that when the brains were out, he thought, and the first word struck into his mind. Time. Now that the deed was accomplished, Time, which had closed for the victim, had become instant and momentous for the slayer. The thought was yet in his mind, when first one and then another, with every variety of pace and voice, one deep as the bell from a cathedral turret, another ringing on its treble notes the prelude of a waltz, the clocks began to strike the hour of three in the afternoon. The sudden outbreak of so many tongues in that dumb chamber staggered him. He began to bestir himself, going to and fro with the candle, beleaguered by moving shadows, and startled to the soul by chance reflections. In many rich mirrors, some of home design, some from Venice or Amsterdam, he saw his face repeated and repeated, as it were an army of spies. His own eyes met and detected him, and the sounds of his own steps, lightly as they fell, vexed the surrounding quiet. And still, as he continued to fill his pockets, his mind accused him with a sickening iteration of the thousand faults of his design. He should have chosen a more quiet hour. He should have prepared an alibi. He should not have used a knife. He should have been more cautious, and only bound and gagged the dealer, and not killed him. He should have been more bold, and killed the servant also. He should have done all things otherwise. Poignant regrets, weary, incessant toiling of the mind to change what was unchangeable to plan what was now useless, to be the architect of the irrevocable past. Meanwhile, 
and behind all this activity, brute terrors, like the scurrying of rats in a deserted attic, filled the more remote chambers of his brain with riot. The hand of the constable would fall heavy on his shoulder, and his nerves would jerk like a hooked fish. Or he beheld, in galloping defile, the dock, the prison, the gallows, and the black coffin. Terror of the people in the street sat down before his mind like a besieging army. It was impossible, he thought, but that some rumor of the struggle must have reached their ears, and set on edge their curiosity. And now, in all the neighboring houses, he divined them, sitting motionless and with uplifted ear, solitary people, condemned to spend Christmas dwelling alone on memories of the past, and now startlingly recalled from that tender exercise. Happy family parties, struck into silence round the table, the mother still with raised finger, every degree and age and humor, but all by their own hearths, prying and hearkening and weaving the rope that was to hang him. Sometimes it seemed to him he could not move too softly, the clink of the tall bohemian goblets rang out loudly like a bell, and alarmed by the bigness of the ticking, he was tempted to stop the clocks. And then again, with a swift transition of his terrors, the very silence of the place appeared a source of peril, and a thing to strike and freeze the passer-by. And he would step more boldly and bustle aloud among the contents of the shop, and imitate with elaborate bravado the movements of a busy man at ease in his own house. But he was now so pulled about by different alarms, that while one portion of his mind was still alert and cunning, another trembled on the brink of lunacy. One hallucination in particular took a strong hold on his credulity. The neighbor hearkening with white face beside his window, the passer-by, arrested by a horrible surmise on the pavement. These could at worst suspect, they could not know. Through the brick walls and shuttered windows, only sounds could penetrate. But here, within the house, was he alone? He knew he was. He had watched the servant set forth sweethearting, in her poor best, out for the day, written in every ribbon and smile. Yes, he was alone, of course. And yet, in the bulk of empty house above him, he could surely hear a stir of delicate footing. He was surely conscious, inexplicably conscious, of some presence. Aye, surely, to every room and corner of the house, his imagination followed it. And now, it was a faceless thing, and yet had eyes to see with. And again, it was a shadow of himself. And yet again, behold the image of the dead dealer, re-inspired with cunning and hatred. At times, with a strong effort, he would glance at the open door, which still seemed to repel his eyes. The house was tall, the skylight small and dirty, the day blind with fog, and the light that filtered down to the ground story was exceedingly faint and showed dimly on the threshold of the shop. And yet, in that strip of doubtful brightness, did there not hang, wavering, a shadow? Suddenly, from the street outside, a very jovial gentleman began to beat with a staff on the shop door, accompanying his blows with shouts and railleries, in which the dealer was continually called upon by name. Markheim, smitten into ice, glanced at the dead man. But no, 
he lay quite still. He was fled away, far beyond earshot of these blows and shoutings. He was sunk beneath seas of silence, and his name, which would once have caught his notice above the howling of a storm, had become an empty sound. And presently the jovial gentleman desisted from his knocking and departed. Here was a broad hint to hurry what remained to be done to get forth from this accusing neighborhood, to plunge into a bath of London multitudes, and to reach on the other side of day that haven of safety and apparent innocence, his bed. One visitor had come, at any moment another might follow, and be more obstinate. To have done the deed and yet not to reap the profit would be too abhorrent a failure. The money... That was now Markheim's concern, and as a means to that, the keys. He glanced over his shoulder at the open door, where the shadow was still lingering and shivering, and with no conscious repugnance of the mind, yet with a tremor of the belly, he drew near the body of his victim. The human character had quite departed, like a suit Half stuffed with bran, the limbs lay scattered, the trunk doubled on the floor. And yet the thing repelled him. Although so dingy and inconsiderable to the eye, he feared it might have more significance to the touch. He took the body by the shoulders and turned it on its back. It was strangely light and supple, and the limbs as if they had been broken, fell into the oddest postures. The face was robbed of all expression, but it was as pale as wax and shockingly smeared with blood about one temple. That was for Markheim the one displeasing circumstance. It carried him back upon the instant to a certain fair day in a fisher's village, a gray day, a piping wind, a crowd upon the street, the blare of brasses, the booming of drums, the nasal voice of a ballad singer, and a boy going to and fro, buried overhead in the crowd, and divided between interest and fear, until coming out upon the chief place of concourse, he beheld a booth and a great screen with pictures, dismally designed, garishly colored, Brownrig with her apprentice, the Mannings with their murdered guest, Weir in the death grip of Thurtell, and a score besides of famous crimes. The thing was as clear as an illusion. He was once again that little boy. He was looking once again, and with the same sense of physical revolt, at these vile pictures. He was still stunned by the thumping of the drums. A bar of that day's music returned upon his memory, and at that, for the first time, a qualm came over him, a breath of nausea, a sudden weakness of the joints, which he must instantly resist and conquer. He judged it more prudent to confront than to flee from these considerations, looking the more heartily in the dead face, bending his mind to realize the nature and greatness of his crime. So little a while ago that face had moved with every change of sentiment. That pale mouth had spoken. That body had been all on fire with governable energies. And now, and by his act, that piece of life had been arrested, as the horologist with interjected finger arrests the beating of the clock. So he reasoned in vain. He could rise to no more remorseful consciousness. The same heart which had shuddered before the painted effigies of crime looked on its reality unmoved. At best, he felt a gleam of pity for one who had been endowed in vain 
with all those faculties that can make the world a garden of enchantment. One who had never lived and was now dead. But of penitence? No, not a tremor. With that, shaking himself clear of these considerations, he found the keys and advanced toward the open door of the shop. Outside, it had begun to rain smartly, and the sound of the shower upon the roof had banished silence. Like some dripping cavern, the chambers of the house were haunted by an incessant echoing, which filled the ear and mingled with the ticking of the clocks. And as Markheim approached the door, he seemed to hear, in answer to his own cautious tread, the steps of another foot, withdrawing up the stair. The shadow still palpitated loosely on the threshold. He threw a ton's weight of resolve upon his muscles and drew back the door. The faint, foggy daylight glimmered dimly on the bare floor and stairs, on the bright suit of armor, posted, halbert in hand, upon the landing, and on the dark wood carvings and framed pictures that hung against the yellow panels of the wainscot. So loud was the beating of the rain through all the house that, in Markheim's ears, it began to be distinguished into many different sounds, footsteps and sighs, the tread of regiments marching in the distance, the chink of money in the counting, and the creaking of doors held stealthily ajar, appeared to mingle with the patter of the drops upon the cupola and the gushing of the water in the pipes. The sense that he was not alone grew upon him to the verge of madness. On every side he was haunted and begirt by presences. He heard them moving in the upper chambers. From the shop he heard the dead man getting to his legs, and as he began with great effort to mount the stairs, feet fled quietly before him and followed stealthily behind. If he were but deaf, he thought, how tranquilly he would possess his soul. And then again, and hearkening with ever fresh attention, he blessed himself for that unresting sense which held the outposts and stood a trusty sentinel upon his life. His head turned continually on his neck. His eyes, which seemed starting from their orbits, scouted on every side, and on every side were half rewarded as with the tail of something nameless vanishing. The four and twenty steps to the first floor were four and twenty agonies. On that first story, the door stood ajar, three of them, like three ambushes, shaking his nerves like the throats of cannon. He could never again, he felt, be sufficiently immured and fortified from men's observing eyes. He longed to be home, girt in by walls, buried among bedclothes, and invisible to all but God. And at that thought, he wondered a little, recollecting tales of other murderers, and the fear they were said to entertain of heavenly avengers. It was not so at least with him. He feared the laws of nature, lest in their callous and immutable procedure they should preserve some damning evidence of his crime. He feared tenfold more, with a slavish, superstitious terror, some scission in the continuity of man's experience, some willful illegality of nature. He played a game of skill, depending on the rules, calculating consequence from cause, and what if nature as the defeated tyrant overthrew the chessboard, should break the mold of their succession. The like had befallen Napoleon, so writers said, when the winter, 
change the time of its appearance. The like might befall Markheim. The solid walls might become transparent and reveal his doings, like those of bees in a glass hive. The stout planks might yield under his foot like quicksands and detain him in their clutch. Aye, and there were soberer accidents that might destroy him, if, for instance, the house should fall and imprison him beside the body of his victim, or the house next door should fly on fire, and the firemen invade him from all sides. These things he feared, and in a sense these things might be called the hands of God reached forth against sin. But about God himself he was at ease. His act was doubtless exceptional, but so were his excuses, which God knew. It was there, and not among men, that he felt sure of justice. When he had got safe into the drawing-room and shut the door behind him, he was aware of a respite from alarms. The room was quite dismantled, uncarpeted besides, and strewn with packing-cases and incongruous furniture, several great pier-glasses, in which he beheld himself at various angles like an actor on a stage. Many pictures, framed and unframed, standing with their faces to the wall, a fine Sheraton sideboard, a cabinet of marquetry, and a great old bed with tapestry hangings. The windows opened to the floor, but by great good fortune the lower part of the shutters had been closed and this concealed him from the neighbors. Here, then, Markheim drew in a packing-case before the cabinet, and began to search among the keys. It was a long business, for there were many, and it was irksome besides, for after all there might be nothing in the cabinet, and time was on the wing, but the closeness of the occupation sobered him. With the tail of his eye he saw the door, even glanced at it from time to time directly, like a besieged commander pleased to verify the good estate of his defenses. But in truth he was at peace. The rain falling in the street sounded natural and pleasant. Presently on the other side the notes of a piano were wakened to the music of a hymn and the voices of many children took up the air and words. How stately! How comfortable was the melody! How fresh the youthful voices! Markheim gave ear to it smilingly as he sorted out the keys, and his mind was thronged with answerable ideas and images, church-going children, and the pealing of the high organ, children afield, bathers by the brookside, ramblers on the Brambley Common, kite-flyers in the windy and cloud-navigated sky, and then, at another cadence of the hymn, back again to church and the somnolence of summer Sundays and the high, genteel voice of the parson, which he smiled a little to recall, and the painted Jacobian tombs, and the dim lettering of the Ten Commandments in the chancel. And as he sat thus, at once busy and absent, he was startled to his feet. A flash of ice, a flash of fire, a bursting gush of blood went over him, and then he stood transfixed and thrilling. A step mounted the stair, slowly and steadily, and presently a hand was laid upon the knob, and the lock clicked, and the door opened. Fear held Markheim in a vice. What to expect he knew not, whether the dead man walking, or the official ministers of human justice, or some chance witness blindly stumbling in to consign him to the gallows. But when a face was thrust into the aperture, glanced around the room, looked at him, 
nodded and smiled as if in friendly recognition, and then withdrew again, and the door closed behind it. His fear broke loose from his control in a hoarse cry. At the sound of this, the visitant returned. Did you call me? he asked pleasantly. And with that he entered the room and closed the door behind him. Markheim stood and gazed at him with all his eyes. Perhaps there was a film upon his sight, but the outlines of the newcomer seemed to change and waver like those of the idols in the wavering candlelight of the shop. And at times he thought he knew him, and at times he thought he bore a likeness to himself. And always, like a lump of living terror, there lay in his bosom the conviction that this thing was not of the earth and not of God. And yet the creature had a strange air of the commonplace, as he stood looking on Markheim with a smile. And when he added, You are looking for the money, I believe? It was in the tones of everyday politeness. Markheim made no answer. I should warn you, resumed the other, that the maid has left her sweetheart earlier than usual, and will soon be here. If Mr. Markheim be found in this house, I need not describe to him the consequences. You know me? cried the murderer. The visitor smiled. You have long been a favorite of mine, he said, and I have long observed and often sought to help you. What are you? cried Markheim. The devil? What I may be, returned the other, cannot affect the service I propose to render you. It can, cried Markheim. It does. Be helped by you? No, never, not by you. You do not know me yet, thank God. You do not know me. I know you, replied the visitant, with a sort of kind severity, or rather firmness. I know you to the soul. Know me, cried Markheim. Who can do so? My life is but a travesty and slander on myself. I have lived to belie my nature. All men do. All men are better than this disguise that grows about and stifles them. You see each dragged away by life, like one whom bravos have seized and muffled in a cloak. If they had their own control, if you could see their faces, they would be altogether different. They would shine out for heroes and saints. I am worse than most. Myself is more overlaid. My excuse is known to me and God. But had I the time, I could disclose myself. To me? inquired the visitant. To you before all, returned the murderer. I supposed you were intelligent. I thought since you exist, you would prove a reader of the heart. And yet you would propose to judge me by my acts. Think of it, my acts. I was born and I have lived in a land of giants. Giants have dragged me by the wrists since I was born out of my mother. The giants of circumstance. And you would judge me by my acts. But can you not look within? Can you not understand that evil is hateful to me? Can you not see within me the clear writing of conscience, never blurred by any willful sophistry, although too often disregarded? Can you not read me for a thing that surely must be common as humanity, the unwilling sinner? All this is very feelingly expressed, was the reply, but it regards me not. These points of consistency are beyond my province, and I care not in the least by what compulsion you may have been dragged away, so as you are but carried in the right direction. But time flies. 
the servant delays, looking in the faces of the crowd and at the pictures on the hoardings. But still she keeps moving nearer. And remember, it is as if the gallows itself was striding towards you through the Christmas streets. Shall I help you? I who know all. Shall I tell you where to find the money? For what price? asked Markheim. I offer you the service for a Christmas gift, returned the other. Markheim could not refrain from smiling with a kind of bitter triumph. No, said he, I will take nothing at your hands. If I were dying of thirst, and it was your hand that put the pitcher to my lips, I should find the courage to refuse. It may be credulous, but I will do nothing to commit myself to evil. I have no objection to a deathbed repentance, observed the visitant. Because you disbelieve in their efficacy, Markheim cried. I do not say so, returned the other, but I look on these things from a different side. And when the life is done, my interest falls. The man has lived to serve me, to spread black looks under color of religion, or to sow tares in the wheat field, as you do, in a course of weak compliance with desire. Now that he draws so near to his deliverance, he can add but one act of service, to repent to die smiling, and thus to build up in confidence and hope the more timorous of my surviving followers. I am not so hard a master. Try me. Accept my help. Please yourself in life as you have done hitherto. Please yourself more amply. Spread your elbows at the board. And when the night begins to fall, and the curtains to be drawn. I tell you for your greater comfort that you will find it even easy to compound your quarrel with your conscience and to make a truckling peace with God. I came but now from such a deathbed, and the room was full of sincere mourners, listening to the man's last words. And when I looked into that face, which had been set as flint against mercy. I found it smiling with hope. And do you then suppose me such a creature? asked Markheim. Do you think I have no more generous aspirations than to sin and sin and sin and at last sneak into heaven? My heart rises at the thought. Is this then your experience of mankind? Or is it because you find me with red hands that you presume such baseness? And is this crime of murder indeed so impious as to dry up the very springs of good? Murder is to me no special category, replied the other. All sins are murder, even as all life is war. I behold your race like starving mariners on a raft, plucking crusts out of the hands of famine and feeding on each other's lives. I follow sins beyond the moment of their acting. I find in all that the last consequence is death. And to my eyes the pretty maid who thwarts her mother with such taking graces on a question of a ball drips no less visibly with human gore than such a murderer as yourself. Do I say I follow sins? I follow virtues also. They differ not by the thickness of a nail. They are both scythes for the reaping angel of death. Evil, for which I live, consists not in action, but in character. The bad man is dear to me, not the bad act whose fruits, if we could follow them far enough down the hurtling cataract of the ages, might yet be found more blessed than those of the rarest virtues. 
and it is not because you have killed a dealer, but because you are Markheim that I offer to forward your escape. I will lay my heart open to you, answered Markheim. This crime on which you find me is my last. On my way to it, I have learned many lessons. Itself is a lesson, a momentous lesson. Hitherto I have been driven with revolt to what I would not. I was a bond-slave to poverty, driven and scourged. There are robust virtues that can stand in these temptations. Mine was not so. I had a thirst of pleasure. But today, and out of this deed, I pluck both warning and riches, both the power and a fresh resolve to be myself. I become in all things a free actor in the world. I begin to see myself all changed, these hands the agents of good, this heart at peace. Something comes over me out of the past, something of what I have dreamed on Sabbath evenings to the sound of the church organ, of what I forecast when I shed tears over noble books, or talked an innocent child with my mother. There lies my life. I have wandered a few years, but now I see once more my city of destination. You are to use this money on the stock exchange, I think, remarked the visitor. And there, if I mistake not, you have already lost some thousands. Ah, said Markheim, but this time I have a sure thing. This time again you will lose, replied the visitor quietly. Ah, but I keep back the half, cried Markheim. That also you will lose, said the other. The sweat started upon Markheim's brow. Well then, what matter? he exclaimed. Say it be lost. Say I am plunged again into poverty. Shall one part of me, and that the worse, continue until the end to override the better? Evil and good run strong in me, hailing me both ways. I do not love the one thing. I love all. I can conceive great deeds, renunciations, martyrdoms. And though I be fallen to such crime as murder, pity is no stranger to my thoughts. I pity the poor, who knows their trials better than myself. I pity and help them. I prize love. I love honest laughter. There is no good thing nor true thing on earth but I love it from my heart. And are my vices only to direct my life, and my virtues to lie without effect, like some passive lumber of the mind? Not so. Good also is a spring of acts. But the visitant raised his finger. For six and thirty years that you have been in this world, said he, through many changes of fortune and varieties of humor, I have watched you steadily fall. Fifteen years ago, you would have started at a theft. Three years back, you would have blenched at the name of murder. Is there any crime, is there any cruelty or meanness from which you still recoil? Five years from now, I shall detect you in the fact. Downward, downward lies your way, nor can anything but death avail to stop you. It is true, Markheim said huskily, I have in some degree complied with evil, but it is so with all. The very saints, in the mere exercise of living, grow less dainty, and take on the tone of their surroundings. I will propound to you one simple question, said the other, and as you answer, I shall read to you your moral horoscope. You have grown in many things more lax, 
possibly you do right to be so. And at any account, it is the same with all men. But granting that, are you in any one particular, however trifling, more difficult to please with your own conduct? Or do you go in all things with a looser rein? In any one? repeated Markheim, with an anguish of consideration. No, he added with despair, in none. I have gone down in all. Then, said the visitor, content yourself with what you are, for you will never change, and the words of your part on this stage are irrevocably written down. Markheim stood a long while, silent. And indeed it was the visitor who first broke the silence. That being so, he said, shall I show you the money? And grace, cried Markham. Have you not tried it, returned the other? Two or three years ago, did I not see you on the platform of revival meetings? And was not your voice the loudest in the hymn? It is true, said Markheim, and I see clearly what remains for me by way of duty. I thank you for these lessons from my soul. My eyes are opened, and I behold myself at last for what I am. At this moment, the sharp note of the doorbell rang through the house, and the visitant, as though this were some concerted signal for which he had been waiting, changed at once in his demeanor. The maid, he cried, she has returned as I forewarned you, and there is now before you one more difficult passage. Her master, you must say, is ill. You must let her in, with an assured but rather serious countenance. No smiles, no overacting, and I promise you success. Once the girl within, and the door closed, the same dexterity that has already rid you of the dealer will relieve you of this last danger in your path. Thenceforward you have the whole evening, the whole night if needful, to ransack the treasures of this house and to make good your safety. This is help that comes to you with the mask of danger. Up, he cried, up, friend, your life hangs trembling in the scales. Up and act. Markheim steadily regarded his counselor. If I be condemned to evil acts, he said, there is still one door of freedom open. I can cease from action. If my life be an ill thing, I can lay it down. Though I be, as you say, truly at the beck of every small temptation, I can yet, by one decisive gesture, place myself beyond the reach of all. My love of good is damned to barrenness. It may, and let it be. But I have still my hatred of evil. And from that to your galling disappointment, you shall see that I can draw both energy and courage. The features of the visitor began to undergo a wonderful and lovely change. They brightened and softened with a tender triumph and even as they brightened, faded and dislimed. But Markheim did not pause to watch or understand the transformation. He opened the door and went downstairs very slowly, thinking to himself. His past went soberly before him. He beheld it as it was, ugly and strenuous like a dream random as chance medley, a scene of defeat. Life as he thus reviewed it tempted him no longer. But on the further side he perceived a quiet haven for his bark. He paused in the passage and looked into the shop where the candle still burned by the dead body. It was strangely silent. Thoughts of the dealer swarmed into his mind as he stood gazing, 
and then the bell once more broke out into impatient clamor. He confronted the maid upon the threshold with something like a smile. "'You had better go for the police,' said he. "'I have killed your master.'" End of Markheim by Robert Louis Stevenson